All right. The, uh, this, uh, the question of being disingenuous. Yeah. Yeah. Now, look, I heard what you're saying. All right. Ne but. But. Let me let me let me see if I can recapitulate your argument. Recapitulate. <laughs> yep. You can I, can I can I state though that yeah. the the accusation of disingenuity, if there's such a word, yes. is uh, um, it is basically a comment about my character and nature, um, which is actually something that um, I don't feel whatsoever. I don't feel a desire to to manipulate the conversation look, away from Look, us. don't be so it's sensitive, damn it. No, but, really? it's, but, it, but it's true. Yeah. It's a bit like your, your, your initial things of feeling that I'm a, um, what was it? A, um, An eccentric. Eccentric. It's oh, good concept, grief. Is it not? Like, it's, it's basically a way of, for, for you to, to begin to emotionally minimise anything I say to you. Right? <laughs> he doesn't like that. <laughs> but, but in reality, the things that I'm pointing out are actually quite truthful. And that's where I feel accusations where you have a slant on a person's character yeah. are actually a way of manipulating conversation away from the real topic. Um, and the, actual ac the accusation itself is disingenuous. In <laughs> disingenuous? Dis Ingenious. In <laughs> uh, was, do you understand? Yes, I do. Um, and and so I find it quite amusing at times when people do that with me when they're trying when they're trying to actually minimise what I'm saying by making a certain character-based assessments as a part of the conversation, when really what we need to be talking about are the topics of teaching that I'm talking about. No, look, I'm not, I'm not interested in attacking your character. But you already have more than once. No, that's what you think I'm doing. No, no, no really, you are really very prickly. <laughs> you are hard to get near because the minute anyone... Good grief! This is the normal to and fro of robust conversation, is it not? <laughs> no. And the minute anyone gets near you and says, oh, that's a bit oh. disingenuous, you go, oh, no, you're attacking my character. No, you, you are. are. I'm just stating a truth. You are attacking it. I'm not saying that I'm very upset about it. Well, no. now, well, <laughs> you're now attacking my character. By you, because now you are, by, by you going through that elaborate argument about what I'm doing, you're now imposing the same thing back on me. What do you mean? Well, you're saying that I have stepped into the situation and I'm trying to protect myself, I'm trying to divert conversation, I'm trying to avoid confrontation with difficult truths, all that sort of stuff. That's what you're saying. No, what I'm and saying... You say that, you say that no, glibly... I no, I never said that at all. Of I course said, you have. I said what I, what I said just now is that there is an attempt to, to um, basically discredit what, what the truth is based on what accusations are being made about my character. Yeah, sorry. And those two things are very different from each other. If I could be of the worst character possible but still be telling the truth um, and an attempt to assassinate or, or to attack a person's character in some way is not the best way to, to manage a conversation with a person when you're seeking the truth. And... And what I'm stating is actually a truth. And what we're used to in the spirit world, uh, because we've lived there most of our lives, is actually having interactions that are much more um, based around you know, principles of truth and actually being able to see people's character based on their condition. And whereas on the earth here, you can't see a person's character because most people don't even know how to read their condition. So I can make a statement to somebody, for example, I can say, I feel this emotion from you and I could be totally erroneous, or I could actually feel that emotion from them and they not even know that they're having that emotion at the time, and I could be totally truthful. And in each case, the person could judge me based on what they think my intention is for making those statements, when in fact my intention has been, is pure. And this is where I find it quite interesting on, on Earth, is that there is this automatic assumption that if a person is sort of confronting the status quo of religion or, or 
or of anything, politics or anything, there's this automatic thing is if we can't get at the person with regard to the avenue of truth, then let's get at the person in regard to the avenue of his character or personality or yeah. history or something else. And it is a clever, clever and manipulative way of getting away from the topic at hand, I feel. Okay. And, and I'm not saying that I'm yeah. not saying that that's what you're attempting to do. What I'm yeah. saying is that many people have been attempting to do that with me in the past by making accusations about my character. Um, when in reality none of the accusations are actually true. But even voicing an accusation that is untrue has the effect of casting doubt on the listener. And this is where we need to take particular care when we're dealing with things in the sense that like, if, if we do know the truth, then it, then it is positive for us to state it in every case. But if we are not sure of the truth, or we feel confronted by the truth and we want to sort of divert, divert the conversational topic onto another topic, we are really doing quite a lot of damage to the, to the uh, aspect of truth on the planet. And you see this happening all the time in politics, you see it happening all the time in religion, you see it happening all the time in the economic structure of the planet. Um, and it's no wonder things are in such a mess on the earth when everyone's trying to get away from what is stating the actual truth, you know. How ups everyone's trying to get away from being uh, emotionally confronted by the truth, basically. And that's why I said in the first century, the truth will set you free. And people don't understand when they meet me how dedicated I am to actually speaking and saying and living the truth. And they feel that my speaking, saying and living the truth is done, by some, done for some ulterior motive that I may have, whatever that be. They don't understand that I just have a dedication to speaking, saying and living the truth. And they don't really get that because for many of them, they personally don't have that same desire and so they don't get me having it. And, but it is something that has been a part of my life all of my life from the first century till now. So, so this is where, you know, so I don't, I don't wish to accuse you of anything uh, about your character in order to uh, disclaim a truth, in order to disprove a truth. The truth is either the truth or not. And I can point out emotions that you may have that prevent you from accepting a truth that I'm saying. And one of these emotions is one, the emotion I was just identifying, and that is the emotion that most people have in dealing with me, that, that they know more about my life than I do. And to, if we reverse the situation and I said to you, I know more about your life than you do, that would be quite a ludicrous statement made to you, and you would feel it. Yeah, but way. see, what, what... Look, I... You're, you're arguing by analogy, right? You're saying... What you're doing to me is like it, it, it is similar to um, what I could do to you, but there is a fundamental difference between what you're saying and what I'm saying. But I, I turn up, I say, "This is me." And, and what's the and fundamental difference? The, the difference is my life is like everyone else's life. I was born as I and, was. Yes, but <laughs> well, I know you were born. <laughs> Well, I was born in the same manner. I was even conceived in the same manner. Yeah, okay. But you see, I, you are saying something that no one else has said in the history of the world. One, you are saying you are the Messiah prophesied from the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. right. Two, that you lived the life of that person, that, that was you in the first century and here you are now in 2011 you see now to say oh you know you can't question that because if you question that you're 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 impugning my character no i'm not saying you can't question it what i'm saying well, is why try to impugn my character while you question it? All right, yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> all right. All right, right, fair enough. No, look, fair enough. You're I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Uh, because I um, see, no, I don't. See, and, why, why, and, and, and I, so far as I have, I do apologise for that. Because right. I do want to... I'm not offended because it happens all the time. But what I'm saying uh, is, why would... You, if I had good self-esteem and self-worth, yes. why would I sit and engage when when in fact I can feel that as a character attack, you know what I mean? Like, like 
you if I wasn't as developed in love as I currently am even and most pe most people on the receiving end of what gets dished out to me would have huge amounts of rage and anger about what's yes. dished out to them and there is also very little recognition of my own uh, friendly and positive responses to a lot of what is quite condescending and arrogant treatment of me and um, and I don't dish out the same people the same yes. things to them so and what I'm saying is I'm perfectly happy for you to question my identity I've got no problems with that mm. but but when you try to question my identity through questioning my character okay now we've got an issue where you're trying to be disingenuous <laughs> okay all right. all right can we can we move on and i will not do that <laughs> no worries <laughs> but it does open up this and i think probably gets back to what you were saying doesn't it mary that in a way that same thing i mean he handles that a lot differently than what you do the identity issue? Yeah, well, the whole issue about people, uh, I mean, people questioning, people questioning you yeah. and yes. saying, what, what the hell do you mean you are Mary yes. Magdalene, you know? Yeah. 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 How Mary feels about that is quite different. Yeah. You just prefer not pe people to not even question you. Yeah, I'm afraid, I'm, like, I feel afraid of um, attacking emotions being projected mm. at me, so I very much diminish my... Uh, like AJ, as you have said, is very forthright about it and um, allows his certainty to be present in, in discussions. Now, I feel that I have um, a large degree of certainty within me, but because of my fear of how other people perceive us... Um, and your fear of our being attacked. Yeah, so I should say as an extension of that being attacked. And violently attacked. Yep. I, I very much sort of uh, soften my... Yes. Uh, is, that, is that because of your memories of your former life? Do you think they... they totally. They, yeah. Totally. That, that's, uh, that's what... Uh, otherwise, like, I don't think... Like, if I didn't have the memories, ironically, I think I'd be far more comfortable just saying it. Uh, of course, then I'd be lying, but you know, it's because of the fears of of that I haven't released yet of that experience. I haven't had any traumatic experience in this thirty two years that I've been here again. So. Mary had a very difficult life in the first century. Though. Well, we heard oh, I've heard a bit about that. Yeah, mm. and then it's still you're. It, it's clear that you're still really coming to terms with all that, aren't you? Yeah. Definitely. Mm. Just remembering, the process of remembering it all again is quite traumatic because you sort of go through this emotional process because of the injuries of our parents in this life. Mm. We go through the emotional, mem we go through the memory as if our parents' emotions are imposed upon those memories. And it's just like quite difficult because you've got to experience those emotions to, to have the memories completely. And it's quite difficult. So, but, um, is I, I don't think you don't believe that reincarnation is a general phenomenon, do you? You know, you you just believe that it began with you. Is that right? So, so I mean, like reincarnation is a general phenomenon from the time I reincarnated onwards. In other words, when was that? So, well, when I was conceived, which was 1962. So, someone just just uh, tell me that again. So, yeah. Reincarnation, uh, for, for a start, if we define reincarnation as what a Buddhist or a New Age person would define reincarnation, then there is no such thing as that reincarnation. The reincarnation I'm speaking of is really one continuous life, but when you reach the condition of a unified soul, which is like, from a soul perspective, the masculine and the feminine become one soul again, when you reach that, perspective, that, that place, you are able to come back to the earth via another manifestation of physical and material bodies, which, for the sake of this argument, we'll call reincarnation. And what that is, is the soul, the 22nd sphere soul, if you like, or the soul that's in this unified state, um, comes back, uh, doesn't actually come back and join to bodies on the planet. There is a, a, a link established between the soul and the two bodies that are created at the time of conception. So there's 
the, at the time of conception, two bodies are created and not one. There's a physical body that's created and a spirit body, which has a very similar set of DNA rules as the physical body. And both bodies are created at the same time but by the parents. That happens for everyone. That happens for everyone. It also happens for every animal on the planet as well, every mammal on the planet. There's the same process that occurs. Two bodies are created. But the soul attaches itself to those bodies and then begins to express itself through those bodies in a case of reincarnation. Now, I'm saying that that type of reincarnation, which is the only type of reincarnation I've ever seen in 2,000 years of existence, only happened for the first time in 1962. Okay, so... Well, that, that wiped out... 90% of the New Age movement, because so many people in the New Age movement, the whole past life therapy thing, all that, it's all based on this idea. That totally. You're, 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 totally. Oh, I, I agree and, with you there. And I've got hundreds so, of explanations that are all very truthful all right. about so how then, that occurs. All the past how life How the past life regressions yeah, happen. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when people are dealing with emotional blocks from the past... Mm -hmm then they're dealing with only this life. Yes, that's great. Okay, so... Which simplifies I mean, which great. it, it greatly, doesn't it? Because, yes. I mean, in the New Age movement, there's no end to it. That's there's, correct. There's, there can be... You, you can deal Six, with it. 600 lives. lives. And, 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 and um, you know, you have people putting out the, the, the Oxford scholars to, uh, um, you know, to go to this person and that person endlessly until you've dealt with them all. And I guess there's whole movements that are based on cl clearing you from... A lot of money goes into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay. All right, I'll, I'll go okay. to clear that up. Yeah. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of that is all just about, unfortunately, what happens around the person who is doing these, these um, past life regressions, if you want to talk yes. about that. Um, what happens around that person is that there are literally a horde of spirits surrounding that person oh. who does them. And when that person gets a visitor come and sit down in front of them, that board of spirits, is one of those spirits is just waiting to connect to that person and then express its unhealed life through that person. And so what you finish up happening is spirit after spirit after spirit after spirit connecting to the person and expressing its unhealed life through the person. Which makes them think that that in fact is them. Exactly. That's exactly right. And the unfortunate thing of doing that is that it then makes that person not focus on their current life's unhealed emotion and therefore their personal growth is severely impacted generally by this past life regression theories. You know, Mahatma Gandhi, interestingly enough, said reincarnation gets you off the hook. Yes. Yeah, and he doesn't believe in it now. Wait a minute, he doesn't? No. Not anymore. No. Have you met him? Well, I've met him. I've talked to him in the spirit world. Yeah, I know. I, I was, I was so saying... No. Yeah, I'm was... sure I've met him in the spirit world, but I can't remember that. Okay, right, right, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he... I mean, it's very intriguing. I mean, I'd, I'd like to sit down with a, um, uh, a history of philosophy. And, you know, <laughs> what about Socrates? What about <laughs> Plato? What about, <laughs> you know. Plato's an interesting character. <laughs> really? <coughs> I feel quite attached. Like he's a, he's a friend who's remained a friend for some time since he became one. Of what do you mean he's a friend? What do you mean he? Well, I've lots of friends. Yes. <laughs> have you have you had some long conversations with him? Yeah, yeah, of course. Would you not? If you oh. had the opportunity. He'd be one. He'd be on my list of ten. Well, yeah. The, the top ten. But yeah, I'd, I mean, Augustine would be first. Well, it was, you know, Plato was well known at my time. You know, you'd hear of the Greeks yeah. coming through and, and, you know, rephrasing a lot of his philosophies. Mm. Mm. And in fact, when I talked to Luke's father, when he came, Luke, Luke, when I first met Luke, he was six years of age, and he came with his father to Israel. And, and um, I talked to his father, and one of the first things his father talked about was the, you know, the theories of Plato and Socrates yeah, and, yeah. and the theories about the soul. And I was more concerned about how Luke's father was treating Luke than I was about the discussion. But and that's another story. But um, yeah. you know, the, the the truth is that many of the people who are Greeks that came to listen to me speak in the first century, and there were quite a number, 
um, most of them had some kind of background in in the Grecian yes. um, philosophers. You know. Well, even Paul was educated by a Hellenist um, mm. rabbi. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was a common. Well, thing. I mean, look at look at Paul's speech at the <laughs> Areopagus. Yeah, it's a profoundly complex engagement with Stoicism. Yes. And and and, 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 and this wonderful. I mean, yeah. I have studied that speech so so many times because to me, that became for me the model as to how I would engage my culture as a oh, Christian. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I thought so. There he is. He's not standing off, pointing at them, saying, "You buggers are wrong." Yeah, you know, exactly. He, he he walks into the middle of their philosophy. Yeah. He quotes their poetry. He, Looks he, for a common he, ground. He, yes, and he he he. he he actually is complimentary. He says, of all people, I see you are the most religious. Yes, And he's course, not yes. being funny. He's be, I, I, I see him as being serious. He's saying, look, you he guys serious, are yeah. really religious guys. Yeah. So now we have something to talk about. Yeah. When Paul and in a way, that. that's, why I, that's the way I engage all people, I think, yeah. to myself. You know, if you're talking to a person who's sincerely religious and a believer, then there's common ground. Yep, always. Mm. You know, you look at every religion on the planet, there's common ground between them all, isn't there? Yes. And, you know, you can always seek common, the common yes. ground. It's the points of differences that create the, the wars of the <laughs> strife and the yes. unity, usually, isn't it? Like, yes. Yeah. And the lack of... Uh, the lack of love is exactly. what creates it in the end. It's not really the points of difference. Cause, you know, we can all have differences of opinion but express them in a loving manner. Or we can have differences of opinion and want to kill each other. It just depends on, you know, what emotions those differences of opinion create within us mm. that we are unwilling to deal with and address. Mm. And, and that's the main problem with regard to all the differences in religion. The truth is, what I'm teaching can be incorporated into every religion on earth if there was an openness to love in all religions on earth, and that's not always the case, unfortunately. You know? do, do you expect that that you you will um, become the Messiah? I mean, you're not... I mean, you are... I mean, a big, I know you are, in, in <laughs> sense, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm saying effectively, in terms of the... This world is crying out for a Messiah... Mm. And you're in Kingroy. Mm -hmm. We've got to be somewhere. Yeah. The, where, where, where do you want to be? <laughs> Sydney. Well, the United Nations. Um, Can you imagine if we rocked up in our uh, thongs, uh, hey, sandals, and hey, shorts? Hey, why not? And well, I mean, if he is, here, the, if he's the anyone, Messiah. Anyone want any words of? No, really, that's what I'm trying. That's David, what I was saying before. David, you know though that people's heart must be open to truth before they can receive it. You know that. Like, if people's heart are clo is closed to truth, then they can't receive it. So the first people I'm going to go to are the people whose heart is open um, and who have a longing for truth and those who have a longing to display love in their life and a longing to practice love in their day-to-day -day affairs. They are the people who are going to attract me first, not the world leaders or the, you know, yes. or the religious leaders or anything like that. I do expect in time that due to the amount of people, common people who are, who are classified as common people practicing the truth and the changes that they make over a period of time, that will definitely have an effect on the people who are the leaders and are the religious leaders and so forth to the point that they might have also a longing for truth and a longing to... Dis to do, you, do you expect them to recognize you? I don't really expect them to recognize me. I would prefer that all they do is recognise when a message of love is being taught and a message of truth is being taught. That, that's my primary concern. Um, recognising me is, really a, a, is not really important in the entire scheme of things in a lot of ways. So well, why, uh, why haven't you spoken to the Pope or the Archbishop of Canterbury? The Pope is not open emotionally to me speaking with him. How do you know? He's a because remarkable. he has the same belief as you, and that is that I'm God. And 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 also much more closed minded than you to even contemplate speaking to someone who's claiming to be Jesus. Um, you know, it would also place 
what would he do if he had to emotionally recognize that I'm Jesus? He would automatically, in a way, if you think about it, he would automatically have to place the church, the Catholic Church, in my care. Would he not? If he emotionally accepted, if he fully emotionally and psychologically accepted that I was Jesus, what would he do? Would he not place the church that he says he's created in my name, in my name, into my... But isn't that what he should do? Well, well, yes, that's what he would, should do, but can you imagine yeah, how much difficulty yeah. that would be. I know, but but um, but also, aren't you saying that in time, when you've dealt with your own emotions, that you will you you will present such a compelling model of love mm-hmm. that. A man of goodwill, as we have got to presume the Pope is, um, and that's where you, well, you can't. If you look at historically, and I'm not saying this yeah. Pope, but historically, if you look at the Popes generally, and um, you could not classify many of them as men of goodwill. Well, that, that, that may be so. <laughs> that may be so. <laughs> let's not impugn their characters, please. No, no, <laughs> I know the characters of many of them. Yeah. I've met many of them. Many of them have since become, you know, true Christians. You know, many of the popes who, you know, in the past did dastardly deeds, if we could say that, have now become Christians in the true sense after their passing into the spirit world and after many hundreds of years of, mm. of the hills um, have, have grown since then. Mm. But the, the issue really becomes what, does the peop- what do the people of today on the planet want to accept? And the truth is that there's a large group of people on the planet who are just interested still in power, control, and and temporal or or political, and um, mm. and and ec- or economic, and those people in power generally very rarely give up that power without a struggle of some kind. Um, many of them, unfortunately, are not in the position where they wish to receive truth, because the truth would actually disband their empire and their power, and that's what they're very concerned about doing. So so. Many of the pro- problems that we face on the planet today are uh, that people will not listen to me currently until such a time as there is a direct manifestation of God's presence on earth through myself, Mary, and others who, who get into that state. People will not listen with very much seriousness. Uh, what do you mean uh, by direct manifestation? That's interesting. Well, in the same manner that I manifested God's presence on earth in the first century through myself, in the sense that I became at one with God and therefore could manifest God's love through myself to others, that will also occur in the future. And that will not only occur with myself, but it will occur with others of the ones who have returned, but also others who have just in their first incarnation who who have a strong desire to get into that condition. And once they do that, the evidence will become overwhelming that what I'm speaking of is actually true. And once that happens, then more and more of these people... Who, who have more resistance because of the power and control that they may have, they will uh, perhaps turn around and listen more carefully to the message then. They won't listen to the message before then because before then it's very unlikely that there'll be enough, um, if you like, miracles that would convince them yes. that, of the truth of what's being said. And unfortunately, this is what I find unfortunate about the process of miracles, and that is... We often discount truth until a miracle is present. And, and from God's perspective, miracles are all based around love. And when love is present, the miracle is already in progress. Mm. And, and this is a part of the problem that we face today, is that we're looking for the miracle without seeing its underlying intention, which is the mm. love that's behind mm. the miracle and, and, and the truth behind the miracle. These are the things that, that men discount until the miracle comes. And unfortunately, there are going to be many who won't be convinced until the miracles come. Um, no, the, I mean, the whole bloody charismatic movement is based on this. Of course. You yeah. know. Uh, uh, the charismatic movement to me... But often it's not is, very loving. <laughs> yeah, it's really based on a, on a, on a, on a, a prevailing attitude of fear that God doesn't exist. Yeah. And so, you, you know, you go along to church and you see, oh, there's a person who's just got $100,000 and they've been blessed or they've been healed. And so that's what gives them confidence to believe. 
And it's not enough. It's shallow. Well, it's not only shallow, but it well, can well, easily well, you be said blessed uh, in the first in the first century. You know, when when Thomas demanded, "I'm not going to believe." Mm. Now, tell us about. I mean, tell us about that because there's a statement there that's been so important to me. Yeah. So when Thomas, what did you think of him? Well, he was my brother, actually. Why? Why? He was one of my fleshly brothers. Why? Why? It's the same mum. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, there's a little bolt out of the blue. Yeah. <laughs> and and of course, growing up with me, he 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 had a lot of difficulty, like a lot of my family, to believe that I was the Messiah. You know, how could the Messiah come from our family? That kind of feeling, and. And also, um, you know, he had a very similar viewpoint of the Messiah to my father. And my father's viewpoint was the Messiah would be a king and a ruler and a person who comes to conquer the Romans and get, a, get the yoke of the Romans off our back. And in fact, they actually believed that I would rule the world in some way, uh, similar to a king like Caesar would have done, um, through power and force, really. But not only through power and force, but through miracles and other things too. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they had a sort of mixture of beliefs. But Thomas was the same. He had the same kind of feelings about that as as my other brothers and sisters had. Um, they weren't, you know, of course, for the majority of my life up until near my death, um, the majority of my family felt that I was just a nutcase um, and often used to follow me around saying so. Um, Thomas was one of those people. He had a love for me, but he and, and he had a deep desire on many occasions to listen to what I was teaching because it fascinated him. But, but on the other hand, he couldn't believe or accept that I was the Messiah because I wasn't what he expected the Messiah to be. And then when I passed, he, he became gut-wrenched with sadness, like as did a lot of my family. They, they viewed me as a very kind, loving person who wouldn't harm a fly, and then I'd been um, basically tortured to death. Um, and he, he had a lot of emotions about that, and he was pretty by the whole experience. And he also then felt that basically his original concept of me, which was that I was just crazy, was true, because I had died. He, he assumed that because I had died, it meant that his mm. original... He, he thought I would never die, basically. Mm. Mm. Um, and so he went back to that original concept and then began strongly to... In, in, inflict that concept, if you like, upon many of the other disciples who were also in a lot of uh, grief and sadness about my passing, um, stating his statements quite forcefully, because he's quite a forceful person, and uh, stating things in a manner that they all began to start to get convinced. Now, looking at all this from the spirit world, I felt, well, no, I've, there's some things I can do here to, to help their faith, you know, to help them get through this period of grief, just grieve me without actually their faith being impacted so much. And so what I decided to do is do a series of what, what you would call manifestations of a physical body, uh, in, or materialisations is the word that we tend to use in the spirit world, materialisation of a physical body in order to prove something. And because... So these are the post, these are the these resurrection are the, appearances. Yeah, these are the post, and, and what are classified as the resurrection appearances. The truth is, there was no. When I discussed the resurrection, I was discussing a totally different subject, and that's a subject on itself. I never referred to a, a resurrection of the body ever, and in fact, I always taught a resurrection of a condition that belonged to the soul that Ammon and a man, the first human couple, lost, and and we regained. But that's a subject in itself. the The issue for Thomas was that he he. He couldn't believe, there was hardly any belief, in fact, of life after death at this point on the planet. And in, in, in fact, the Greeks had a lot more faith in that, and so did, so did the Indians and the Egyptians than anybody in Israel. In, in Israel, the teachings of life after death were very loose and ill-defined. And, and Thomas basically went back to his original way of thinking, which was, this life is all there is. Death is the end of it. Look what happened to him. He was just. He, look what happened to my brother. Basically, is what he was saying. You know, he was. He, he told us all these wonderful utopian things, but that's all they were. Just wonderful utopian things. They really meant nothing. Look at him now. He's dead. And you, you know, look where we are now. It's We're come all, to nothing. It's come to nothing. We, we've believed somebody who's yeah. been off his rocker, and um, and basically, at the end of the day, 
um, what what can we do about that? Nothing. And you know, he was quite. There was quite a lot of very strong language being used with with the rest of the disciples as well present, and that caused there were about twenty or thirty present um, um, initially, and then that gathered, that grew and grew, and eventually had he had quite an audience in this house of listening to him about what his theories about the whole happenings were all about, and looking at this from the spirit world, they locked their doors, of course, because they. Um, who were afraid that some of them would be taken and crucified. Mm -hmm. And many of my family in particular were very concerned about that. You know, my, my father was a member of the Sanhedrin and he, uh, he was even concerned for his own life. And, and all of my brothers were very concerned about their life, particularly the ones who had come along with me, like James and Thomas. And so w what they did is they gathered together, with all, they locked all the doors, and I thought, well, this is a good opportunity for me to present to him a body and demonstrate to him that I'm still alive. And so what I did was materialise a body, but I materialised a body with holes in the wrists of the of of my body to to remind him, if you like, that that I was the person who was crucified. And then I appeared to him, and the rest there, the rest present, and uh, and in the process, uh, I still feel a bit emotional about me. In the process, um, they, like Thomas, was at, like just shocked, really, um, at my. So, do you feel emotion, do you? Yeah, of you course. Feel, yeah. After two thousand years. Yeah, well, I'm still working through. This is what Mary's been saying to you. Every time we have memories that we haven't yet fully dealt with emotionally, the emotion will come up as a part of the memory. Does that make sense? And there's things. But, that, you know, I guess it surprises me a little that after 2,000 years. You, it's not after 2,000 years. Oh, it's, it's because you're in, in this new. Uh, you're, dealing, you're, you're starting off. It's fresh. since, yeah, since right the right. reincarnation. Yeah, 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 okay, right. Yeah, right, yeah, right. No, I've, I've, so it's like you've got to start again a bit. I've got to remember everything through the emotional impact of my parents, whatever that be. Your current parents. My current parents. And so whatever my current parents emotionally imposed upon me and whatever beliefs they emotionally imposed upon me is a part of the process of reincarnation. Wow. And that happens to every child. So you've got to go through that whole thing again? Well, I've got to go through the process of remembering it and then I've got to go through the emotion of allowing the emotion of that, of, that locks up the memory to be present. So for me, this emo when, what, what I'm feeling is a bit of a feeling of my love for my brother, Thomas, and a feeling of like how much he didn't believe me before I passed, uh, as did the majority of my family, and um, and how much afterwards by my appearing to them, they sort of converted from almost total disbelief into like total faith, like within one experience. So my appearance to the majority of the disciples aside from Mary because Mary, Mary totally believed in everything I was talking about before mm. I passed, mm. but she was one of the very few who did. Um, most of them just liked hearing everything I was talking about, but didn't have a very strong feeling that it was truth in their heart. And But after I reappeared to them after my passing, and by materialising these bodies, one after a succession of bodies that I materialised in, one after the other, um, some of them were different in form. Uh, which is the reason why different ones yeah. couldn't recognise me. And, and that process of uh, coming back to and speaking to them again caused them to, um, to have this immense faith. And it was their immense faith then that got them through. And in fact, the immense faith began the whole Christian movement. Mm -hmm. It was the immense faith of the followers after my passing and reappearance to them that actually began the Christian movement. So... So then, coming back now, as you have, do you expect there's going to be, we'll have the same result? If that was the beginning of the church, I mean, what's your expectation? I mean, are you going to do this a number of times? Do you, I mean, is this the end of, uh, uh, end of the world? So what's going to, I mean... Surely, surely you've got some sort of scheme here. Of is course. This, I mean, you know, you you've, mean got another, you've got another 30 or 40 years to go. No, no, I've got hundreds of years to go. Yeah, but in, people you know, allow me to do. <laughs> well, you, you might live, what, to be well into your... Well, no, the truth is the body is able to replicate itself every seven years. 
and and once we're in a state of purity and at one with God, that replication process becomes a pure process. So every seven years, your body is completely renewed in all its facets. And so the truth is that any person in at one with God has the capacity to live forever on earth if they chose to. So why didn't you live forever in the first century? Because I got killed. What? <laughs> that was so a like, my choice. <laughs> yeah. So if somebody shoots you, you're still mm. going to die. Well, but you're not going to age. You're not going to develop oh, okay. illness in your body because you're not holding on to anything. And you can heal most ill when, when are you going to stop? When you uh, well, uh, that's it. You can't answer that, I guess. Well, when you well, no, you can answer that to a degree. Right. In the in the, you know, I can't give the date and time. But what I, what I can say is that um, if, if nothing untoward befalls me before I desire to pass, then I'll pass when I desire to. In other words, I'll dematerialize the material body I'm attached to at the moment and pass. But but if that 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 will only occur, and that would have only occurred in the first century if no one. Had, mm -hmm. had wanted to kill me. And the same applies to um, any person who's at one with God. That, that, that is something that okay. applies to every single one, um, not me specifically. And the key, the key is the first stage, if you, if you asked about the plan. Yeah, asked. that's what I want to know. I mean, I want to know, I mean, what's the point in coming here? Mm -hmm. I mean, the world is in such a mess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've got to see something mm -hmm. happen, surely. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, and I mean, I'm not seeing a lot. <laughs> From us, you're yeah. referring to, yeah. Well, that's yeah. because as yet, you're yet to see love, in a way. No, no, no I'm not. I'm talking about... Miracles. The, the, no, 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 I'm talking about miracles. <laughs> I'm talking about just the sheer reality of your impact on the international scene. There won't be an no. impact on the international scene until the point of time that I yeah, obtain sure. the same condition as I obtained in the first century. And, and But like, do you have the expect so you believe that one day mm -hmm. you'll arrive at that point mm -hmm. and then suddenly we're down in the first gear. Yep. And things will happen. Things will start and then happening. there'll be a manifestation. Things are already starting to happen as they did in the first century before I reached that point. Because it's like a, a gradual place of getting into more and more and more and more harmony with divine love, right? But you reach the point of transition, which is the point between the seventh and the eighth dimension in the spirit world. But here on earth, it's a point between having an intellectual concept of everything to having a soul concept of everything, and also being connect and feeling the permanent connection with God 24 hours by seven. So, so the permanent connection with God, once that is reached, that is at one moment with God. And once you reach that, that's when you can do things like healing and all those, you know, giving sight to the blind, healing limbs and all those other things. And um, all of those things will be present, but they are all just a subsequent result of the love that's present. And it's the love that's present that is really the important message and the, important, and the truth that's present. They are the two important things that need to be given to the world. And my feelings are that once once the first of the 14 who have returned reach that condition, then the first part of our mission is complete. Because the first part of our mission was, how do we help humanity in a condition of sin reach a point of perfection and at-one-ment with God on the earth before they pass? Have you got to wait for these other... Well, why, why are these other characters out there if they're not, if they're not really you know, pulling their weight out there? I mean, buzz them off. <laughs> just forget about them. Sorry, we're we're you're here, but we're we're just deleting you from the story now because you're not you're not helping our figures. <laughs> that wouldn't be very truthful, would it? No, I love you. No. No, I reckon it would be truthful. I mean, truth in the sense that you know, I mean, if they're not on the team, and many of them are not on the team, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but that it, they have their free will still, David. Like they they are allowed to choose to yeah. be not on the team, and and that's. So, uh, but why? Uh, my question is, I guess, why do you even talk about them? I know, I mean, well, they, why, they, why, why are they part of the plan? Did, the, did you guys get together? Yes, they, look, they, uh, yes, in they the long were term, a part of the plan. They are right. a part of the plan. They decided. We decided seven soul pairs, fourteen different individuals, if you like, seven soul pairs, yeah. decided to to enact this plan because it was God's plan and we wanted to fulfill it. Um, 
So, and also... Did they come in 1962? No, for after them. So, so, oh, okay. so I arrived first, and then there were a series of others who arrived over a period of... Well, the youngest, I think, now is around 24 or 25. Are there any more coming? There are more people reincarnating, but not for the same purpose. Um, the purpose of the first seven is completely different than the others who are, re who are reincarnating. I want to meet these characters. Well, it's they a shame we can't... Have you met them? Um, no. Oh, two. Two. The two guys who... Three. Lived, uh, oh, three. And maybe... Um, three. I don't know three. three. Um, yeah. Well, I've met all bad ones. Mm. But if you decide to come again, come to our home and yeah, I will. Meet I'd like to. Yeah, yeah, you can meet. I'd like to. Yeah. yeah. The, oh, okay. Um, so there's two in Australia. You said that. Uh, there's more uh, than there's three. Yeah, I, th I understood that. There's three more in Australia. Right. Um, and um, there's um, eight overseas. Okay. No, that's six. Or seven. Well, then there's two, a couple. There's a couple of missing. No, eight. Eight overseas. So then where's the other two? One's passed. Oh, I see. So we all, we all decided together before we came to come, and we all decided, you know, how and what and where we would, we would incarnate to. Um, but, but we all realised too that the attitude of a person sitting up in a condition of love, in bliss with God, in bliss with their soulmate, is very different to now coming to the earth and feeling the abandonment of those things. And therefore the decisions that you make in that place are very different to the decisions you make mm. on the earth here. And so we all realised that there was a potential that, that, that maybe none of us might even um, reconnect with ourselves fully and, and therefore enact the plan that we had, you know, that we felt within us. Um, but, but at the moment, four of us are. Um, and I feel more and more will as the four of us continue to progress. But it's sort of like, um, like it's a truth, even though it's not a, a, pal a palatable truth for some to hear, but also it's a truth even though it might not support my cause. D does that make sense? Like, not entirely. Well, I'm happy to speak about truths that don't support, uh, don't give the outward appearance of supporting my cause. Like, unlike most people who are... Oh, I can't We were being jovial before and you were sort of yeah. saying, just forget about these guys. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, okay, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, okay, right. I know I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, a, I'm happy to talk about things that don't seem to support the cause um, or even maybe give the impression that, the, that it's not true. Yeah. And as long as I'm still speaking the truth, I feel in the long run the truth will become yes. known. Um, I have a deep trust in God's truth and a deep yes. trust and faith in God that all truth eventually becomes yes. enough. And so it doesn't worry me if it looks bad. Yeah. All that worries me is what it is. Okay. The if question before, me. though, was about the purpose of being here, and I think that's the question. Well, the, fir the first part of the purpose is to demonstrate becoming at one with God from a condition of sin so that mankind can do it. Like they can actually do it. They can so you present the model. You present the model. You, you demonstrate through yes. our own lives, you demonstrate to mankind how you do it. So this, this involves two of you. You're not, you can't do this on your own, can you? Well, I we mean, Mary's got to be with you. We can do the first part on our own, we, in the sense that we can become at one with God on our own without mm -hmm. our soulmate, which is what I did in the first century. But the second part of the journey is to demonstrate the power of the soul union the power of the two halves of the soul joining mm. and what immense power and love that provides both for each individual but also for the planet as itself. Mm -hmm. And that part certainly cannot be done without the other person exercising their will to do the same thing. Um, so the first part can certainly be done quite, quite sim when I say quite simply, it's not, a, it's a, not an easy process but it isn't quite a simple process. The first part can be done individually, but the second part needs to be done with the joining of the soulmate. Um, and then, of course, once that those truths are demonstrated to the earth again, of course we want to talk about lots of other truths that are available to mankind that they don't know of at the moment. Mm. Scientific, religious, 
spiritual and otherwise. Um, and we, there's a lot of information we want to impart to the planet on, in that regard. Um, but, but that's a sort of a secondary mm. thing, really. Okay. Yeah. And then the third thing is obviously be a part of the changes that occur on the earth during this period of time so that uh, mankind can be led through this, this, this change and into a new world that, that where love does prevail, even if it's only natural love, where love prevails and, uh, and truth prevails and openness prevails and transparency prevails. And, and those changes may take a few generations of time to make, but uh, I feel quite confident they will be made. Uh, this is probably a good time to have a break. Sure. Mm. Should we go for a drive? Let's go for a drive, damn it. That, that, yeah. Well, <laughs> yes. For a man. Well, it, it ended, ended fairly nastily in your former life. Yeah, but it would even be worse if I was a mediator. You imagine every person who goes to God having to go through me first? That means I've got to personally listen to every person speaking and also personally relay that message to God. Um, it would be a very difficult task given that I'm not infinite like God is. 